In my last video, I gave an overview of Genesis chapter 1 and explained what it's actually trying to tell us. When I got to verse 26, I said that I had an opinion on who God is talking to when he says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So in this video, I want to answer that question. Who is God talking to? Let's jump into it. Genesis 1 verse 26 reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. I used to think that when God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, he was speaking to himself as a Trinitarian God. Now, what I mean by a Trinitarian God is that he is one God with one essence, but within him are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who have relationship with one another. That's a Christian teaching that was developed in the second century AD. Like I said, I used to believe that about this passage. Now, what I believe is that God is not speaking to himself as a Trinitarian God, but he's speaking to his divine counsel. A group of heavenly angelic beings that he created before mankind, and that he's inviting them into this act of creating man. I believe that this view is more historically accurate, that it presents the worldview of the ancient Jewish or Hebrew reader, that it is capturing what the author is trying to say. And I feel like this view is actually getting back to what the Bible is trying to say here. Many scholars today have made this switch from the Trinitarian explanation to God speaking to his divine counsel because they would say the same things. They see that during the period of time in between the Old and New Testament, that the rabbis within their writings interpreted Genesis 1.26 as God speaking to his divine counsel. They would also see things like archaeological evidence and other Jewish writings, such as the book of Enoch, playing a role here. To properly understand the ancient Hebrew worldview, we do sometimes have to go outside of scripture. So I want to share with you some archaeological findings from 1928 that I think will help us make a full picture of the Jewish world view in which the Hebrew text was written. In 1928, archaeologists discovered a city north of Israel in modern-day Syria called Ugarit. Now what makes this find so significant is that they also found thousands of Ugaritic texts, and the language that they wrote in was the most similar to ancient Hebrew. So we can assume that the ancient Hebrew people and the ancient Ugaritic people had very similar worldviews because their languages overlap so much. And within the Ugaritic writings, we see the stories of their god, El, the chief god, being the creator of all things and creating other gods, including a god that rules with him named Baal. Now, we shouldn't let this alarm us because what we see in the Old Testament is that a people who do believe that the God of the Bible is the true God. And what they're doing is actually oftentimes responding to other cultures and other worldviews that got it wrong. So we would say, that the Ugarites got it wrong, and the Hebrew people were correcting the perception of God and clarifying who he was. At this point, I could hear some of you maybe thinking, well, Daniel, this is all stuff that's coming from outside of the Bible. What about the Bible? What does the Bible have to say about this idea of the divine counsel? Does it support this idea? And with that, I'll say, yes, it does. So let's look at some other texts that support the idea of the divine counsel. The first passage I want to go to is Genesis 11. And in Genesis 11, we get the story of the Tower of Babel. The people of Babel are coming together and they say, come, let us make bricks. 
Let us build for ourselves a city and a tower. Let us make a name for ourselves. And in verse 7, the Lord responds with a parallel phrasing. He says, come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Now I get it. This is very similar to what Genesis 126 says. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. It uses the same phrase, come, let us go down. And we could see that as, well, God is speaking to himself again here. But as I said, I think it's more historically accurate. It's more accurate to the Jewish concept, which even led into Jesus's day of thinking of God being amongst a divine council that he created and a council that he invited into ruling with him. To continue to support the idea of the divine council, I want to take us next to Psalm 82. Psalm 82, one reads, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Jumping down to verse 6, it reads, I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Again, this might alarm us because this passage seems to be indicating that these heavenly beings are also considered gods. So within the ancient Jewish worldview, what they believed is that there were these different angelic beings or heavenly beings that were divine in some nature, meaning that they resided in heaven. They could be considered gods. They could be considered angels. There are a whole bunch of them that have different roles and responsibilities. But what we need to take from here is that God, the creator of the universe, the God of the Bible, is the most high. He's the one that created all of them. And as verse 6 here in Psalm 82 says, all of the other created angelic or heavenly beings are considered sons of the Most High. That's significant, and I want us to remember that terminology, sons of the Most High, as we continue to look at other passages, because that's going to really help us to try to connect some dots here into how we should understand Genesis 1 verse 26. The next passage we need to go to is Psalm 89, verses 5 through 8. They read, Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? Now, I need to make a statement here. Here in the ESV, we read, Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord. But in the Hebrew, we actually have the word elim, which translates to the English heavenly beings here in the ESV. But a more proper translation for the word elim would be sons of God. So we could reread verse 6, for who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of God is like the Lord? Continuing verse 7, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all who are around him. Verse 8, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. The picture that we need to grasp here is that God is surrounded by other beings that he created to fill the heavens, to fill the the space we cannot see. And those beings are oftentimes called sons of God. They are thought to be his children in some regard. The next passage that supports this is Job chapter 1 verse 6. It reads, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and the Satan also came among them. God is in heaven and his sons are coming to present themselves. Who are those sons? They are the heavenly beings. 
those that he has called to rule in the heavenly space. Let's next go to Isaiah 6, starting verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Is what the Lord asks Isaiah. He isn't talking for himself here. He's talking for his whole divine council. He is the Lord of hosts, sitting in heaven, surrounded by angelic heavenly beings. So when he says, who will go for us? He's speaking on behalf of the entire host of heaven that is surrounding him. In Daniel chapter 7, we see something similar. In verse 9, it reads, As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. So once again, we see God sitting among thousands, ten thousands of angelic heavenly beings that are serving him and that make up his court or his divine counsel. But this idea doesn't stop in the Old Testament. It continues to the New Testament, even into the very words of Jesus. Next, we're going to go to Luke chapter 20, starting in verse 34. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Did you hear that? Jesus says that if we make it into the next age, if we're a part of his kingdom, we'll no longer marry or be given in marriage that will be equal to the angels. And what does it mean to be equal to the angels? It means that we will be sons of God, sons of the resurrection. An angel is God's son. And we are being invited by Jesus to also be sons of God. And this is not the only place that we see this. Once again, Jesus says, this time in Luke 6, 35, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. That sounds a lot like Psalm 82.6, doesn't it? Sons of the Most High. 
We are being invited to be sons of the Most High through following Jesus. And so when we go back to verse 26 of Genesis 1, it's not, again, as I said, God speaking to himself as a Trinitarian God. It is actually him speaking to his divine counsel, his heavenly beings that he's already created, that he considers to be his sons. So what God is doing in Genesis 1.26, when he invites his divine counsel into the creative act of mankind, is he's inviting them into his work, rulership, agency, just as he invited mankind to be a part of that as well. But here on the earth. It's this beautiful picture of man and angels being like each other. So what God is doing in Genesis 1:26 is he's inviting his divine counsel into his work, into the creation of man, into that agency just as he invites mankind into having dominion on the earth. And I know this might be a concept that's difficult for some to wrap their minds around, especially if you haven't heard of it before. But what's good to know is that most Christian scholars today are starting to move back towards this approach of looking at the Bible on its own terms and reading it as if they were an ancient Jewish person, reading it how it should be understood. The late Dr. Michael Heiser wrote and taught a lot about the Hebrew worldview that we need to read the Bible through. And in his book, The Unseen Realm, he presented a really great way in how we should understand the grammar of Genesis 1, verse 26. So as I said, it's, it's not God talking to himself. But the image that Dr. Michael Heiser gave was as if a person walks into a room occupied by their friends, and they say, hey, let's get pizza. Similarly, God is walking into his divine council and saying, hey, let's make man. So how is that similar? Well, the person who walks into the room and says to their friends, let's get some pizza, they had the idea. They called up, they placed the order, they drove to the restaurant, They paid for the pizza, they brought it back, and their friends got to enjoy it. Similarly, God came in and said, hey, I have this idea. Let's make man. Let's do this this way. And then he created man. And we know this is true because it's what scripture tells us. Genesis 1 verse 27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So it's not that we are actually created in the likeness of both God and angels or the divine counsel, but we are like the angels created in the image of God, in his likeness. Therefore, we are brothers and sisters with the angels. We, like them, are God's children. And if we follow Christ, we are invited to be sons of God, just like the angels are who serve him and reign with him in the heavenly space. What Dr. Heiser explained is similar to the concept of the Hebrew plural of majesty. All that means is that within the Hebrew, what we see when referring to God is a plural noun instead of a singular noun. So in Genesis 1, when we see God, the Hebrew there is Elohim, which is the plural form of the singular word El. So we shouldn't read that as gods, but what we're seeing here is God is being identified as the most high God, the most majestic being there is, And to give him honor and respect and reverence, the plural noun is used instead of the singular noun. We also see this in other cultures, even in our culture today in the United States. 
We can imagine the president going before Congress and saying, we need to pass this bill. We need to make this decision. We need to make peace. We need to go to war. And if he were to then address the American people, he might write a speech or, or have a speech that says something about, we the people have declared this. Now, that doesn't mean that every single United States citizen has participated in the writing of that document or the passing of that bill. And we know that also there are those who would vote against certain bills that are actually passed. So again, this is a concept in which even in the United States, we see that person who has authority speaks on behalf of the nation. Likewise, God is the one who has all authority in both domains, heaven and earth. So when he speaks, he's speaking on behalf of all his creation. And so when he says, let us make man in our image, or let us go down and confuse their language, or who should, who should go on behalf of us to Isaiah, he's speaking on behalf of his heavenly host, just as a king or a president would speak on behalf of their people. The amazing thing about this is that God, the creator of the universe, is a God that invites his creation to participate in what he's doing. In the creation of man, God invited his sons, the angelic heavenly beings he created before us, to participate, to be there, to be present in some way. And now he's also inviting mankind to participate, to have dominion, to rule the earth in a way that shows people who he is, that leads people to him. This is the God that created us. This is the God that invites us into relationship with him. So this is a profound, huge concept that we need to carry with us as we continue to read scripture, because it's a worldview in which it's going to help us understand what's happening, especially in the Old Testament. And will also help us interpret the New Testament correctly in what Jesus and the apostles were actually saying in their writings. So if you made it to the end, please smash the like button, subscribe, share this with someone that you think might find it valuable, and join us next time as we look at what it means to be made in the image of God. Have a great day. See you next time.